Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. In today's video, I'm going to be reading some classic fairy tales that inspired the Disney Renaissance films. I've bitten the back of my tongue, so it kind of hurts when I talk, so I'm trying not to talk too much. So I am trying to keep my tongue away from my back teeth. It's just not gonna happen. It hurts so much. I've been wanting to do this video for quite some time. I used to do some videos based on Disney films and the books that inspired them. But I think the really formal format of those videos made it less enjoyable for me to make them. So I want this video to be really, really chill and a lot more accessible, I guess. It's gonna be really hard to do because I can't speak right now. Ow. And I was gonna try and read the books that inspired some of the later movies too, but I'm just gonna stick to the classic fairy tales because, you know, I don't wanna overwhelm myself and I do wanna have a more chilled video that's less than an hour, hopefully. We'll see how that goes. I also wanna do this video because The New Little Mermaid has been released and I I was so excited to say it and I got to say it. Was it over a week ago now? I think it was. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was so good. I thought Halle Bailey as Ariel was incredible. Her version of Part of Your World is top of my Spotify on repeat playlist. That's how much I love it. I mean, yeah, the film's not perfect and the original will hold the biggest special place in my heart. And I will talk more about my experiences with each film when I get to those sections of the video. But the first one I will be reading is The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. I do know a lot of these fairy tales are a lot darker than what Disney made them. And the same can be said about the books that I did read for the earlier classics, especially Pinocchio, oh my God. But I'm so excited to read this and I love this edition of it so so much isn't it so cute and so beautiful look at this stuff no we're not going to be doing any singing today i've got to rest my voice and then i will be reading aladdin and the arabian nights but more specifically there is a story in this called the wonderful lamp which is what specifically inspired Aladdin. This one is part of 1001 Nights, I believe it's called. It is a collection of Middle Eastern folk stories, so I don't think I can attribute it to one specific author. But yeah, I'm just going to read that one specific Aladdin story in this. The story of Aladdin or the Wonderful Lamp. So that's what I'll be reading for Aladdin. I'll most likely watch the original and the remake at some point this week too. Same with The Little Mermaid. I might go back to the cinema to see The Little Mermaid, you know. And then finally, I'll be reading Beauty and the Beast. Now, the vision I have, I'm not 100% sure because it doesn't actually say who the author is. It does say that Beauty and the Beast was first written by Gabrielle Suzanne Barbota Villeneuve. I said that so wrong, I apologise. But the version in this, I believe, is the one by Andrew Lang from the Blue Fairy book, because when you turn the page, it does say Beauty and the Beast from the Blue Fairy book. So I think this is the version written by Andrew Lang, but it's still the same fairy tale that inspired the movie. So I will be reading this. And I do want to thank Claire so much for sending me this copy of it. It is absolutely gorgeous. And these three are the only three that I will be reading in this video. Now I know there are more films in the Disney Renaissance, which I should have got to that were inspired by books and things. So like say the Disney Renaissance, if you do not know the Disney, ow. <laughs> if you do not know the Disney Renaissance, it is a series of films that were released between 1989 and 1999 by Disney that really turned the favour of the studio around. Disney before that were in the Dark Ages or the Bronze Age of their eras, I guess, that you would call them. The Disney Renaissance Storm with the Little Mermaid helped to bring financial and critical success back to Disney. So yeah, we had The Little Mermaid in 1989. That was the start of the Disney Renaissance. Then we had The Rescuers Down Under in 1990, which is not the best part of the Disney Renaissance. It's probably like the low point of it, but you know, it's still part of that era. Then we have Beauty and the Beast in 1991 and Aladdin in 1992. And so Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin are the fairy tales. Those are the only ones in the Renaissance that were inspired by a fairy tale. And then we have The Lion King in 1994, which was partly inspired Inspired by Hamlet by William Shakespeare. I was gonna reread that for this video too, but we're just gonna keep to the fairy tales. And then it was Pocahontas, I believe, in 1995, but that was inspired by a real life story of Pocahontas. And Disney definitely changed a whole lot on that. So yeah, we're not gonna touch Pocahontas in this. And then we have The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1996, which was inspired by the book by Victor Hugo, which I'm so excited to read and I've been desperate to read it for the longest time, but we're not going to read it in this video. It's not inspired by fairy tale. In 1987, we have Hercules, but again, that is inspired by Greek myth. Or oh, I think Hercules is his Roman name. 
I believe. But anyway, it's inspired by myth, so I couldn't really fit that in. Then we have Mulan, also based on a real life person. And then we finally have Tarzan, which was inspired by a book called Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Now, one day, I think I will probably end up reading Hunchback of Notre Dame in Tarzan of the Apes for a video because I am really excited to read those. So I actually have loads of things to do today. I'm off to say Legally Blonde the Musical in my hometown. I think it's an amateur university production of it. So I'm really excited about that. Might do some book shopping, but I will take you along with me. So let's get started. Let's get into it. But make sure that you like this video if you enjoy it and subscribe if you haven't already. Okay, now come be part of my world. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That's so cheesy. I'm sorry. The great yellow sun is reflecting in your deep blue eyes. The day has begun. You spin around, you spin around, you laugh to yourself And I see you shine in every color, resting your head in my arms You sing la 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 My God, I think I might be in love Get rid of all your sorrows in the summer city You'll never feel alone as long as you're Okay, I know it looks like I haven't even moved from this seat, but I promise it is later in the day. I have been to see Legally Blonde, the musical, which I was correct, it was some kind of like university project thing. I think it's to get these kids to the West End, essentially like some kind of like West End training school. And it was so good, actually. I really enjoyed it, it was a good production. I went to see Legally Blonde, the musical last year at the Open Air Theatre in London. And that was fantastic too. Elle Woods. Elle. Amelia Ashman. She was fantastic as Elle. In fact, the entire cast were great, okay? The entire cast were awesome. So yeah, I got myself a little program as a memento of the trip. Also had a cheeky Nando's, yes. I did also haul some manga. So I'll quickly go through that as a little book haul. I got the first volume of Toilet Bound Hanukokan. Hanukokan? <laughs> uh, not sure how to pronounce that. Got the first volume of Fairy Tale. I never say the first volume of Fairy Tale in any store. So it was actually pretty cool to say that. Food Wars, the first volume of that too. I did get a lot of volume ones in this because I do want to try and do a sort of 31 manga in 31 days video at some point. I did get the third volume of The Titan's Bride. Got the first book of Vinland Saga. Very excited to read this. And then finally I got Remina by Junji Ito. So those are the manga books that I got. I don't want to speak too much about it because this ain't no book haul video. I will do a proper book haul video this month. And then finally, I do have a big fairy loot box. And this one is definitely more relevant because it says on the side here that it is the Luna set. But these are relevant because the Luna Chronicles are based on fairy tales themselves. And I really did enjoy reading them four years ago that I wanted to get this set. Don't you just love getting a big, huge box full of books? Oh, ho, 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 ho. oh my God. Oh my god, oh my god, you guys. Well, firstly, we have Cinder, which is the first one, based on Cinderella. Then we have Scarlet, based on Little Red Riding Hood. Then we have Cress, which I think was Snow... No. Who was Cress again? Rapunzel? I think Cress was Rapunzel. But Winter, Snow White, huge. But this is what they look like all together. Kind of hard to hold. But I love it. I love it. I think they look awesome. That was a book haul segment. I am actually going to get into reading now. I do have a members only live show tonight. So I might try and read The Little Mermaid before that. Do the live show. Come back to you guys. We're going to see how we get on. And this vlog will have spoilers for the original fairy tales. Because I do want to like talk maybe about the differences, the similarities, the dark stuff that goes on. So be wary of that going forward but yeah let's get into actually reading and starting with the little mermaid <laughs> Thank you. 
Damn it, I knew I should have went for the next size up, but Ash and Torbu don't look at me. They're literally both looking at us like, what the f***? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah? Oh, I really hope I don't do a nip slip. So I finished The Little Mermaid, and yeah, it's definitely not as whimsical as the Disney version. But one thing that I don't see a lot of people mention is that The Little Mermaid does get a happy ending. I mean, yes, it doesn't go exactly the way she wants, but I've always had in my mind, and again, there's gonna be spoilers for this section, for The Little Mermaid fairy tale. I mean, it's been around for a couple of hundred years, so, you know, spoiler warning right there. So yeah, I think this is the first time I've actually read it all the way through, but I had heard in the past that the Little Mermaid, who doesn't actually have a name, she has to kill the prince, but she can't do it. So she throws the dagger away, jumps into the sea and becomes safe form and dies, the end. Like that's what I've always been sort of told and that's what I've always thought of the ending. I mean, that still does happen, but then something happens after that, which is actually a happy ending for her. So anyway, let's get back to basics. I really did like this. I thought it was very well written, especially, you know, at the start, we have so many visuals of this underwater kingdom and a lot of lush imagery. Like, I can really feel like I was under the sea. <laughs> Let's see how many little mummy puns I can fit into this. So some things that were different, actually. So at the very start, we do have the setting being brought up, but also the fact that the Mer King is barely in this. He is barely in this, he barely does anything. It's mainly his mother, so the Little Mermaid's grandmother. She's the one who mainly does things. She's the one who kind of, well, she seems to not exactly rule the kingdom, but she manages the household affairs. So while King Triton is the one in the movie, he was very formidable, but he does look out for his daughters and you can really feel him being such a passionate father. None of that, none of that in this fairy tale. But we do have six daughters. I don't think that's how many is in the film. I believe it's seven daughters, isn't it? Seven daughters for the seven seas. But the little mermaid is the youngest, the most lovely. Her skin was soft and delicate as a rose leaf. Her eyes were of as deep. I don't know if that's like a typo because that doesn't make sense. Her eyes were of as deep a blue as the sea. Her eyes were of as deep a blue as the sea beats me. But like all other mermaids, she had no feet, her body ended in a tail like that of a fish. So that's the first time we ever meet the Little Mermaid. What I love about this story more than the remake and the original is that the sisters are a lot more present and they have a lot more agency and it feels like they're also really excited about the world above. So I would have loved to have seen more of the sisters in the films. On their 15th birthday, they are permitted to rise to the surface of the sea you will then sit by moonlight in the clefts of the rocks, see the ship sail by, and learn to distinguish towns and men. So these mermaids are allowed to go up to the surface when they turn 15, and I believe they're allowed to go up any time they wish after that too. And all of the daughters really want to see the world above, and all of them think it's absolutely beautiful and amazing. And in this story, we do have the mermaids going up one by one, because they seem to be born a year apart. So yeah, every single year the daughters go up and the Little Mermaid is just getting more anxious about her turn until it finally comes. And when she goes up, that's when she sees the prince and she does absolutely fall in love with him straight away. She's just fascinated by it, but she's fascinated by like the whole world essentially. Like she really does love the idea of being above the ocean. So again, like, even in the fairy tale, the original fairy tale, it isn't just about the Little Mermaid giving up her voice and her life essentially for a man, she does just want to be part of that world. <laughs> what would I give to live where you are? Toby, don't look away when I sing. The ship does go under, she saves the prince and she takes him to the shore, but he doesn't ever really see her. He doesn't wake up and, you know, get a blurry image of her and then want to find her for the rest of his life. Instead, there is this woman who comes down from nearby church and wakes him up and gets him back up to the castle. And he falls in love with her. But for the longest time, he thinks that she is part of this church. And so she can't ever be with him because she is committed to this church. So during all of this, the Little Mermaid is learning more about humans from her grandmother. And she says that they must die like us and their life is much shorter. We live to the age of 300 years, but when we die, we become form on the sea 
and we are not allowed to share a grave among those that are dear to us. We have no immortal souls. Human beings, on the contrary, have souls that continue to live when their bodies become dust. They ascend to glorious unknown dwellings in the skies which we are not permitted to see. So there are some religious allegories and religious imagery in this. A lot of ideals that are brought forward, especially by the end too, because yeah, it's a fairy tale written in the 1800s. I can imagine a lot of people were pushing their agendas and they say gay people push an agenda. <laughs> But the Little Mermaid, she wants that immortal soul. She wants to be able to, I guess, live after death, but to see the world as well. So it's not just the fact that she wants to trade her voice for this man. She wants to trade her fin and her voice so that she can eventually become an immortal soul in heaven. I guess is what this is alluding to. I would willingly give up my 300 years to be a human being for only one day, thus to become entitled to that heavenly world above. It's not just all about man, which even then, I think in the original animated version, yes, Ariel does fall head over heels in love with Prince Eric, but she also wants to see the world and she's very fascinated by human stuff and all of that. So again, like it's not just all about a man. It's not all about a man. <laughs> and the grandmother says, and this is probably what really drives the Little Mermaid forward to see in the Sea Witch later on, or the Enchantress as she's called in this. She says about humans, if he loved thee with all his heart and promised whilst the priest joined his hands with thine to be always faithful to thee, then his soul would flow into thine and thou wouldst then become partaker of human bliss. So essentially she's saying that she needs to get married in order for her to see heaven, which it's not the best thing to uh, say to a very impressionable 15 year old, but she's acting like Sebastian. She's saying it's much better as it is. We live longer and are far happier than human beings. So she's basically saying that the human world is a mess. Life under the sea is better than anything they've got going on up there. So she is acting like the Sebastian. She's trying to sort of convince her to be happy with what she has. But then the little mermaid does end up deciding to go to the Enchantress. And I love the journey to the Enchantress. Her house, which is like part of the turf moor, and it's filled with trees and bushes and they look like hundred headed serpents shooting up out of the ground. There are whitened skeletons of a number of human beings who have been drowned in the sea. There is a wood of horrors, a house built of the bones of unfortunate people, of oh, those poor unfortunate souls in pain, in need. So I love the imagery there. I love this journey to the Enchantress. She's never called the Sea Witch. I don't know if maybe this was modernized or translated at all, but I love the, the visuals. So she's gonna make the Little Mermaid a drink, which she must swim to land. Transformation will be very painful. You will feel as though a sharp knife passed through your body. Everyone will think that you're the loveliest child on earth, but every step you take will cause you pain all but unbearable. Can you endure all the suffering? If so, I will grant your request. So there isn't really a deal struck because she says you can never again become a mermaid when once you have received a human form. So she is saying like, no matter what, you take this portion, you're human forever. She also doesn't give Ariel a deadline, as in like you have three days to get the prince to fall in love with you. She says, unless the priests join your hands so that you become man and wife, you will never obtain the immortality you seek. The moral of the day on which he is united to another will see your death. Your heart will break with sorrow and you will be changed to form on the sea. So essentially, if this prince marries anyone, it doesn't matter how long that takes, it could be a year, it could be five years, the day after he is married to someone else, you will die and become form on the sea, essentially. So like she has all the time in the world, essentially, like there is no ticking time bomb on her. But she does say, thou hast the sweetest voice of all the dwellers in the sea and thou thinkest by its means to charm the prince. This voice, however, I demand as my recompense. So she does take the Little Mermaid's voice but she does that by cutting off her tongue. It's a little bit like Cinderella that isn't it with the stepsisters when they're cutting off and mutilating their feet in order to get it to fit into the glass slipper. So it is extremely graphic and brutal that she has to do that but also the fact that every step she takes with these human legs it feels like knives and her feet bleed. It is disgusting but she does go up to the world above she is seen by the prince and he takes her in, but every step she takes, it is painful, but she doesn't show it on her face and she has given away her voice forever. So even if she does marry the prince, she will never have her voice back. So she does get a little bit close with the prince, but he never sees her as somebody he would ever marry. He is very fond of her, just not wife material, you know? The prince says that he is to be married to a beautiful daughter of the neighboring king, which turns out to be that woman who came down from the church and he thinks saved him, but obviously it was a little movement who saved him. 
So he has fallen in love with her. He thought that she was married to the church, but it turns out she was just there for an education. So that was a twist and they end up getting married very quickly and it breaks the little mermaid's heart. And then the sisters, you probably already know all of this, but the sisters, they have given their hair to the sea witch in order to get this dagger so that the little mermaid can kill the prince and return to the sea as a mermaid and not turn to form. Before the sun rises, thou must plunge it into the prince's heart and when his warm blood trickles down upon thy feet, they will again be changed to a fish-like tail. Thou wilt once more become a mermaid and wilt live thy full 300 years. So, I mean, remember this girl is only 15. So like she's barely lived her 300 years as a mermaid. So I did feel absolutely awful for her, just like, what a dilemma to be in, you know? Very grim, it's very, very dark that she does this. And I love how in the new version of The Little Mermaid, I think it's Skull who keeps getting it wrong when she says, so has she killed the prince yet? So I think that's like a really good nod to the original fairy tale. And then, yeah, all at once she threw far out into the sea, that instrument of death, and she throws herself into the sea. So she does become form, but then she is also transported into the air. So she ends up speaking to the daughters of air, Neither do the daughters of air possess immortal souls, but they can acquire them by their own good deeds. And essentially travel the world. Like they're getting a free worldwide trip out of being daughters of the air. By doing good in this manner for 300 years, we win immortality. So now the little mermaid is alive in a way. She is just part of the air. She is air. <laughs> but you know, she's getting to do what she wants to do and that is to see the world. So she does kind of get her happy ending unless that was added to the fairy tale and it was changed to be a lot more brighter after she died, maybe? Like maybe she did just turn into safe form and then that was the original Hans Christian Andersen story. You know what, I should have researched that, but it didn't really cross my mind to do that. I mean, I could do it right now, but I'm sure someone will tell me the original or the right ending for The Little Mermaid. I mean, yeah, obviously it's sad because I guess now she can't really see her sisters again, but you'll have your man. Except she doesn't have her man, but she does have her freedom to go all over the world. It's not perfect by any means, and I do still feel really bad for her. But yeah, I really liked it. I thought it was a really good little fairy tale. It wasn't too long. It was only about 30 pages, and I had a fun time reading it. Definitely very different to the films, but I can see the inspirations, and I definitely do love the films a lot more. And you can't really have The Little Mermaid without the songs, can you? sha la 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 my oh my, look like the boy too shy, and gonna kiss the cat, Mwah. Whoa, whoa, oh, you're just so cute and beautiful. Oh, are you my flounder? Toby, are you my flounder? Yes, yes you are. You know what, ever since talking about The Little Mermaid, I've been in the mood for fish. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna make this as my Hello Fresh today. Bonjour! <laughs> well, it's a tale as old as time, isn't it? But I have finished Beauty and the Beast, and it was only 16 pages long, so it really is a short read. And I feel like, yeah, The Little Mermaid was definitely more, but I wonder if it's because it's in, like, a really compact short book, so maybe the writing was a little bit bigger, and it was spread over you know, quite a few pages. But yeah, I'm not 100% surprised by anything that happened in this. Well, actually, I was surprised by the Beast. He isn't as initially beastly like he is in the films. He is actually quite reasonable and he will not accept any daughter of the merchant, the, the man, what's his name again in the film? Uh, Crazy old Maurice. That's it, crazy old Maurice, hmm? The Beast won't accept Beauty. She is just called Beauty in this. She isn't called Belle, but I guess Belle does mean Beauty in French, so you know. But the Beast will not accept her unless she is 100% consensual to the sort of imprisonment in the castle, which I guess does get carried forward into the films, but it's a lot more dubious, I think, a lot. Like, the line is a lot more blurred in the films than it is in this. Like, she is 100% fine and happy to stay in place of her father to save her father. There is no prologue in terms of setting up the scene here of the beast being enchanted by an enchantress, but there's no explanation for it. There is no focusing in on this curse. So firstly, and you know, I have highlighted in my pretty books and I don't care, these are my books, okay? And if somebody finds this a hundred years from now, they'll know that I read it. 
okay? If they ever come across this library, they will see some very well-loved books. So I've definitely come to terms with the idea of writing in my books, no matter how pretty the book is. It looks pretty with a nice blue highlighter. I probably should have done pink. But yeah, the merchant, aka Crazy Old Maurice, he has six sons and six daughters. So he's been very, very busy. And they were filthy rich. Filthy rich and beautiful, beautiful, dirty, dirty rich. And from great wealth, he fell into the direst poverty. So they end up having to all move to a cottage. And I don't know how they managed to do that with 12 children and this old man. There was no mention of the mother, so we don't know what happens to her, which is also something that we have in the films. I believe she might have died in the animated version, but I don't think she was ever really mentioned. I don't think, not that I recall, but I do know it was more of a focus on in the remake. And just like The Little Mermaid, it is the youngest daughter who is the most loveliest and the nicest, apparently. So in this one, yeah, the youngest tried to be brave and cheerful. Uh, she was really far prettier and cleverer than they were. Indeed, she was so lovely that she was always called Beauty. So why is it always the youngest child? I'm the middle child. It should be the middle child who is the prettiest and cleverest. So this is something I take issue with these fairy tales, always making the youngest the best. That just ain't the case. If you're the youngest, I don't want to hear it. One of the reasons why the father was put into poverty was because he had a lot of cargo ships and they all essentially went missing. But apparently one of them was found and had come safely into port with a rich cargo. And I mean, this is something that might be a bit of a plot hole, which, you know, I probably shouldn't bring up in a fairy tale. But yeah, the father goes to this place and it takes a few months. And it says here, his former companions, believing him to be dead, had divided between them the goods which the ship had brought. So how the hell brought that news to him? If they thought he was dead, then how did they go to crazy old Maurice and tell him, oh, when his ships has been found? So surely somebody there knew he was alive and where he was in order to give him this news. So I don't understand that. And I shouldn't read into it because again, it's a fairy tale. So as a middle child, I like to nitpick. But also before Maurice, I'm just gonna call him Maurice. It's just a merchant, but Maurice, Maurice does ask his children what they want. And that's where I think the live action Cinderella, I remember has Cinderella's father ask them, what do you want me to bring back? And we have the stepsisters ask for so many riches and dresses and all of this. And in this, all of the sons and daughters ask for really expensive things. Whereas Beauty only asks, well, one, for him to come home safely. But then he says, come on, you need to ask for something proper, come on. And she says, well, bring me your rose. And I remember in the live action Cinderella, yeah, she asked for a branch or like the first branch that brushes your shoulder on the way back or there. I don't know, it's been a while since I watched the live action Cinderella. Really good film, by the way. I really do enjoy that Cinderella. But also I seem to remember in the animated and the live action that Belle does ask for a rose. And it's just like with all siblings asking for expensive stuff that I kind of likened it to that Cinderella. But she has no siblings in the films. So I found that really interesting that they cut out 11 siblings in the films. So once he realizes that he's getting no wealth from the ship, he goes back and he comes across that castle. There is absolutely nobody around. There is a dinner waiting for him. It's all nice and warm. He falls asleep, blah, blah, blah. And then on his way out, this path had a hedge of roses on each side of it and the merchant thought he had never seen or smelled such exquisite flowers. They reminded him of his promise to beauty and he stopped and had just gathered one to take to her when he was startled by a strange noise behind him. Turning round, he saw a frightful beast. Who told you that you might gather my roses? Was it not enough that I allowed you to be in my palace and was kind to you? So in the original version, Beast knows that Maurice is there the entire time and he does allow him to take shelter, gets him food and things like that. Although he doesn't show himself, he still allows it. And I think both the animated and the live action, the Beast doesn't know he's there and it's the servants who have been turned into different inanimate objects that look after Maurice. But actually it's it's Beast in this. So he is showing him kindness and he does actually let him into his home. But then he's like, you deserve death. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that is a bit too extreme. I mean, yes, it's not nice of this man to shoot down your hospitality by stealing something from your garden. I absolutely agree. But come on, let the punishment fit the crime. And even Maurice tells the Beast everything. He's like, look, listen, I've been through it. This is my story. And that's exactly what he does. And the beast does feel compassion towards him. I will forgive you on one condition. That is that you will give me one of your daughters. And the beast says, if she comes at all, she must come willingly. 
on no other condition will I have her. I give you a month to see if either of your daughters will come back with you and stay here to let you go free. If neither of them is willing, you must come alone after bidding them goodbye forever, for then you will belong to me. If you do not come, I will come and fetch you essentially. So yeah, of course, like this is unfair. It's not a fair punishment. But what I like about it is that I will not accept any of your daughters unless they are 100% consenting to this. But again, obviously they're gonna want to save their dad, right? Well, <laughs> the merchant does come back home and it seems like none of them want to do it because they just all blame beauty for the whole exchange. And even Maurice is like so bitter towards her. He's like, here is what you asked me to bring you. You little know what it has cost. And I'm just like, come on. Like she was the only person who was nice enough to not demand something too strenuous when you went the first time. Come on. And anyway, she only wanted him to come back safely. He's the one who pressured her into picking something a lot more tangible, and so she went for a rose. So come on, you can't be guilt and beauty for asking for a rose when you're the one who pressured her into asking in the first place. And then poor beauty, she's like, I have indeed caused this misfortune, but I assure you, I did it innocently. I will therefore go back with my father to keep his promise. So, like, they've all guilted her into doing this. And I, I feel so bad for her because it genuinely wasn't her fault, ugh. And yeah, it seems like when the beast meets her, like they are so cordial, like he never locks her up or anything and gives her free reign across the entire castle. There is no, you have to keep out of the West Wing kind of situation here. There is no wiltering rose that's ticking his life down. Essentially, as soon as Maurice and Beauty come back to the castle, he says, both of you spend the night here. Maurice, you're gonna have to go in the morning take two suitcasefuls of any of the riches in this castle. So like, again, he's showing so much like kindness towards him, but I know what, I'm so conflicted because this isn't a good deal because yeah, she feels obliged to stay there to help her father, but he's shown so much generosity and kindness to, uh, you know, allow him to leave with all of this rich stuff that will help the family. Oh God, I'm so, I am so conflicted. It's like, I'm trying to justify it, but it's hard to in my mind. I can say the kindness is not as mean as he is in the films at all. In fact, he never does a mean thing other than ask for a daughter in return of him trying to steal from him. So in that way, you can see the parallel between stealing something precious from the beast with stealing something precious from the merchant. And yeah, he keeps telling her, do not be deceived by appearances all this, that, and the other. She exposed the place, there is a library, so that's still in there. And yeah, it seems like he's in the friend zone until he gives her his library. As said in the princess rap battle between Cinderella and Belle. It seemed to her a whole lifetime would not be enough to even read the names of the books, there were so many. I mean, look, obviously I don't condone what the beast is doing here, but I would totally live there. Considering the family who Belle belongs to are so ungrateful and, you know, even after they've lost everything, they still seem to be so entitled. I would leave them too. The beast lets her do whatever she wants during the day and at night they talk for about an hour and at the end of each conversation the beast asks beauty will you marry me and she always says no and he leaves like he doesn't pressure her he doesn't try to guilt her he doesn't try to change her mind he's just like okay and then goes and then every single night she dreams about this really handsome prince. Now this is where I'm like uh, you really see like the shallow side of beauty but also the manipulative side of Beast. Like, no matter what way you put it, it is toxic to see this relationship. And again, like, this is an old fairy tale, I know this. But yeah, you see the manipulation that the Beast puts her through while Beauty is very defined by Beauty, essentially. She's all about that. She sees this prince in her dreams and she loves him. Like, she genuinely loves him. But just because he is beautiful, there is no conversation, there is no... Thing that this prince has done in her dreams to warrant the love. Whereas the beast, he has shown her a lot of kindness. He's getting her food and all this and the other. But again, it is manipulation at the end of the day. So she immediately falls in love with this handsome dreamy prince, but rejects the actual person who is giving her all of this stuff and allowing her to do all of this stuff. But yeah, again, it's a, it's a tricky line to cross, isn't it? She says, let me go for two months and I promise to come back to you and stay for the rest of my life. And he says, if you do not come in good time, you will find your faithful beast dead. So he does actually allow Beauty to go for two months 
to her home to see her father, to see her siblings. And in her dreams, she tells the prince, because the prince in her dreams is like, why are you leaving me so? Like, you're breaking my heart. And she says, I would die to save him from pain. I assure you, it is not his fault that he is so ugly. So yeah, it does tie back into the whole, you shouldn't judge people by appearances. But again, like the beast is manipulating the hell out of her, so. But the thing that I really don't enjoy about this version of <laughs> anything, but like this version of beauty is that she never seems to have the smarts to come up with things herself. So when she goes home, she tells her father about her dreams about the prince and about how they keep saying don't judge appearances. And it's the father who says, I think the prince must mean you to understand that you ought to reward him by doing as he wishes you to in spite of his ugliness. So he is the one who is imparting on her this moral that you shouldn't judge people based on appearances. I mean, however, you should judge people by their actions. And again, this beast is manipulating the fuck out of it. And it's like, oh, it's okay because he's showing you kindness and he's giving you all these treats and gifts and stuff. I'm just like, she thought of her dear prince who was so handsome, she did not feel at all inclined to marry the beast. And then we find out that the sisters got used to being without her and they would find her in the way most of the time. It's like there is no love between this family. So Beauty, she does desperately want to go back to the beast and throughout these two months of being away from him, she realizes how much he wants to be with him. And when she gets back, she thinks he is dead and he's lying on the floor. Oh beast, how you frighten me. I never knew how much I loved you until just now when I feared I was too late to save your life. And then this is where like the manipulation really comes in because the beast is like, can you really love such an ugly creature as I am? Ah beauty, you only came just in time. I was dying because I thought you had forgotten your promise, but go back now and rest. I shall see you again by and by. Like he was collapsed on the floor, looked like he was dead. But no, he's actually fine. And it was just like the thought that she wouldn't come back that made him act this way. I'm just like, again, that's like such a huge manipulation tactic. I'm just like very wary of that. It's like, imagine you're in a relationship and you're trying to leave somebody and they act like this when you, as soon as you're gone, essentially, they act like they're about to die. It's like the most manipulative and toxic thing you could possibly do. So then when the beast asks Beauty, will you marry me? She says, yes, dear beast. So only after all of this has happened, she agrees to marry him. After it seems to be like relentless pressuring, even though it doesn't look like pressure because he has treated her with kindness by doing all this stuff for her, but remember why she's there in the first place. So then as soon as she does that, there is a blaze of light and then he disappears. Beauty found that he had disappeared and in his place stood her long loved prince. So like throughout this entire time, the prince she was dreaming of was the beast in front of her all along. So, <laughs> when you say like the moral behind that, sure, you know, like, uh, once she looked beyond appearances, she saw that what she longed for, what she dreamed for all along was right in front of her. But again, those dreams were planted uh, in a manipulative way by this beast, by this prince in the first place to pressure, oh shit, to pressure her into doing this. So again, it's like, fuck's sake. So yeah, they end this by getting married. So what I love about the Disney remakes is that Belle has a lot more agency. Again, it's like not a perfect story because you know, there's a lot to unpack there, but I love Beauty and the Beast. I love the film. I love the songs. The songs are so fantastic. But yeah, it seems as Belle isn't as like smart and as quick as she is in the films. So I do think the films definitely improved the fairy tale, even though the Beast seemed like Oh, I will not accept her unless she is 100% consenting. But again, the circumstances means that she can't give her 100% heart into it because it is a manipulative tactic. Word of the day is manipulation, children. But I do understand like this is a classic fairy tale for a reason. It is beautifully told. I do think the imagery of this was absolutely gorgeous. The description of the castle was beautiful too. But yeah, I think our modern day sensibilities makes this a little bit harder to read. But I enjoyed my time reading this. I do love reading classic fairy tales because there is a certain whimsy to it and a certain charm to them. Despite the subject matter, I just love the way that they're told. And also there weren't any servants who were made into clocks or candlesticks in this, so that does take away quite a lot of the charm of the films too. All in all, not the best, but I'm so glad I finally, finally read it. 
I haven't worn my trusty Aladdin jumper in such a long time, but I feel like I might have to throw this out soon. I've had it that long that it is washing out. Aladdin's hair is now green, and I mean it still fits, but you know when you just had a shirt or a jumper for so, so long and you can just tell that you've had it for a long time? This is what this feels like, as much as it paints me. And I love the fact that it has 92 as well on this. Oh, hang on. Oh, there we go. For some reason, I thought that maybe it had been damaged even more. But no, it does have 92 on the side. 92 was the year that Aladdin was released, but it was also the year I was born. So I just love this jumper so, so much, but it's getting on a bit, just like me. Oh, also, fun idea, actually, if you're still here, leave a comment down below. Let me know what Disney classic animated film came out the year you were born. And if a Disney animated classic didn't come out the year you were born, leave any Disney film that came out that year. I'm always so intrigued. Like, what does your birth year say about your Disney animated classic film? But I have finished The Story of Aladdin or The Wonderful Lamp, as it is called. And oh, <laughs> I feel like I shouldn't fairly rate these fairy tales, because they are fairy tales, they're dated. And definitely not, again, what I pictured or envisioned from this story, insanely different to the films. Oh, okay, let's let's talk about it. Right, so let's start from the beginning. I found a good place to start. So Aladdin, he is the son of a tailor, and his father is called Mustafa. Not to be confused with the Lion King with Mufasa, but he is Aladdin's father, and not too long after we're introduced to him, literally three paragraphs later, he dies. He was trying to get Aladdin to learn one of his trades, but Aladdin, he is a very idle child. He loves to play out with his friends, which, you know, he's a child, it's allowed, but it does mean that he hasn't learned what his father wanted to impart on him. In hindsight, the whole story, I don't understand what the hell any of this came up to because usually there is lessons learned or morals learned from either fairy tales or folk tales like this one and honestly by the time we get to the end of it you're gonna be like what did we learn? So Aladdin does still have his mother though. His mother is very loving and she's also trying to get Aladdin to be more active and to learn something but one day a weird stranger comes by Stood and watched him closely. The stranger was a sorcerer. And you get the element of Jafar from this person. However, this sorcerer is not the royal vizier. There is a different royal vizier character that comes up later on. But the sorcerer who comes at the start, he just randomly sees Aladdin and decides he is the one who is going to go into this cave and get me this magic lamp. But instead of just taking him away or anything, what he does first is he tells Aladdin that he is his uncle and he gives him some money to give to his mother. And Aladdin goes back to his mother, gives her the money, tells her of the encounter, and she says, your father had a brother, but he's been dead a long time. So just from the off, it's like really obvious that this sorcerer is not Aladdin's uncle. But Aladdin, he sees the money, he sees the possibility that maybe this will help his mother and himself, and runs with it. So the sorcerer does end up coming to the house and meets the mother and the mother is very enchanted by him. And it's like not a problem because it looks like the sorcerer is about to reverse their fortunes essentially and take Aladdin to learn a trade and stuff like that. So that's what we get for the first part of the story. And then we do have the sorcerer take Aladdin to this very barren place, divided by a narrow valley, which was the place where the magician intended to execute the design that had brought him from Africa to China. And also, yeah, this is set in China, by the way. Aladdin gets scared and he would have run away, but the magician caught hold of him, abused him, and gave him such a box on the ear that he knocked him down. So this sorcerer is like very physically violent towards Aladdin and is still holding up this pretense that he is his uncle, which honestly, by this point, I was like, Aladdin, just run, just run. But you know, he is a child still and very easily influenced. The sorcerer tells him that under the stone, there is hidden a treasure destined to be yours and which will make you richer than the greatest monarch in the world. Descend into the cave, said the magician. So Aladdin goes into this cave. It's not like this big, huge, thing that comes out from the sand. I think he just moves some rocks over and there is an entrance. But Aladdin is the only one who can go inside. So there isn't that whole like diamond in the rough element to it. It's just that the sorcerer needed to find a random boy to go in for him because you can only have this lamp if somebody else gives you it. That's the only way that you can possibly control it, which is contradicted pretty quickly. <laughs> do not touch the walls so much as with your clothes, for if you do, you will die instantly. And tells him to get a lighted lamp. The sorcerer also puts a ring on Aladdin's finger, the ring that he's been wearing, and Aladdin goes down. He does fill his pockets with food and he does get the lamp. And he goes back to the entrance and he says, pray uncle, lend me your hand to help me out 
give me the lamp first, replied the magician. So just like in the films, we do have the magician sorcerer slash Jafar be like, give me the lamp. And then Aladdin like, no, help me out first. And he's like, no, give me the lamp first. So we have that whole thing. But the sorcerer in this, he just loses his temper and locks Aladdin's side. He just totally forgets about the lamp. He doesn't seem to care anymore. Immediately the storm moved into its place and the action plainly showed that the magician was not his uncle. I mean, I'm glad we got to that point now for Aladdin and I'm glad Aladdin knows this. But what is so different to the films here is that it isn't the lamp that the genie comes from in this moment, it's actually the ring that the magician gave him. So I don't understand exactly why this magician, this sorcerer, had to get Aladdin to get a lamp that had a genie inside it when he has a magic ring with a genie inside it that can do all the things that the genie in that lamp can do. And we say that moving forward as well, the genie of the ring can perform all of the magic and all the wishes that you want. So why do we need this lamp? <laughs> you know? In joining his hands, he rubbed the ring which the magician had put on his finger. Immediately a genie of frightful aspect rose out of the earth. The change with this is that it isn't like the genie of the lamp or the genie of the ring. It's actually like the slave of the ring and the slave of the lamp. There's like a lot of mention of slaves and slavery in this, which is honestly something that only further enhances the deplorability of Aladdin as a character moving forward. But I also know that this is of its time. The genie saying, I am ready to obey thee as thy slave and the slave of all who may possess the ring on thy finger. I and the other slaves of that ring. So it's just like the constant repetition of slavery and slaves. The fact that the genie has no choice but to do this. And there is no Robin Williamsification of the genie, either genie of this, because there are two genies. There is still a genie in that lamp that does come into the story. But again, both of them are just there to be slaves. They have no development or anything like that. So it's extremely hard to read, to be honest. And it's Aladdin's mother who actually rubs the lamp and the genie of the lamp comes out. And Aladdin tells him, I am hungry, bring me something to eat. And he keeps telling the genie to do this. So there is no limit to the amount of wishes that you get from the genie of the ring or the genie of the lamp. So that is something that the movies added in to, I guess, add stakes to the story. Because if you do have unlimited wishes, then you have one for nothing really. But if you had a limited amount of wishes, you really have to think and use your wishes carefully. And you know, we have here Aladdin just saying, I'm hungry, bring me something to eat. So the genie does grant the wish and there are all of these gold plates that Aladdin sells to a merchant. And I think there is some anti-Semitism stuff in there, some like stereotypes when it comes to Jew representation. But the merchant has been conning Aladdin and Aladdin isn't too happy about that. But there are other merchants who show him how much these plates are actually worth. So there were a lot of parts of this fairy tale, folk tale that just kind of, I, I don't know, like when I think of the whole story and all of the morals that we learn, not exactly learn. I just feel like all of this segment was just so unneeded. But when Aladdin's out and about, everyone's commanded to shut up their shops and houses and keep within doors while the princess, the sultan's daughter, goes to the baths and yeah, nobody's allowed to look at the princess. But Aladdin, he doesn't follow the rules and he looks upon the princess and he falls in love with her. So this is when I was like, oh, he's gonna, you know, want to be a prince so he can have a title worthy of the princess, right? That's not, mm, the stuff that happens with the princess in this, honestly, it is incredible to see the transformation that Disney put into Jasmine and her agency and given her an actual voice and character. Because in this, oh my god, you know that, um, I think the line that Jasmine says in the animated one, where she's like, I'm not a prize to be won. Well, picture a Jasmine where she is the prize to be won. So Aladdin goes back to his mother and says, I love the princess and I'm resolved to ask her in marriage of the Sultan. And the way to get the Sultan to be convinced of marrying off his daughter to this nobody is to give him presents. So this is when we actually meet the Grand Vizier, the actual Grand Vizier. And when his mother comes, because Aladdin never meets the Sultan. In fact, it doesn't sound like Aladdin leaves the house during this whole thing, but he gets his mother to go every single day to the palace to try and get an audience with the Sultan so that she can ask for her son to marry the princess. And she has to do that for, I think it was about a week before the Sultan realizes that she's been there every day and then ask her what she wants. Bear in mind, she's an old woman, right? And he is getting her to do this every single day. Aladdin is not a, a good 
person in this at all. He's very, I mean, there are times when he shows some selflessness and some generosity, but what is this actually like teaching people? Anyway, she shows the Sultan the treasure, the presents, the jewels that the genie had given, and the Sultan is amazed. And the Sultan says to the Vizier, is it not worthy of the princess, my daughter, and ought I not to bestow her on one who values her at so great a price? So he is going to essentially let Aladdin marry his daughter because he brought these jewels. But the Vizier says to him, I beg of your majesty to grant me three months before we come to a final resolution. I hope before that time, my son, whom you have regarded favorably, will make a nobler present than Aladdin. So we have the Vizier who doesn't act like Jafar, but he just has Jafar's title. He gets his son to marry the princess. It's like two months later and she's gonna be wed to the vizier's son. But Aladdin, he gets the genie to kidnap both of them. And I don't know what actually happens during this time because each time the princess is terrified by this and even the vizier's son is terrified by this. And the genie takes them back after each night and this happens for two nights and then the wedding's canceled. So it's like, okay like random and also the fact that nothing is explained of what actually happened during that time so what you just like kidnap them for two days what to scare them out and get married and I mean it works it does work and then another month goes by and the sultan pretty much has to fulfill his promise except the sultan then demands more treasure he says I will fulfill my promise as soon as he shall send me 40 trays of massive gold full of the same sort of jewels you have already made me a present of and carried by the like number of black slaves who shall be led as many young and handsome white slaves all dressed magnificently. So this was like extremely uncomfortable like to watch, to read, to see the illustrations. It was very uncomfortable at this point because then we do have all of these slaves dressed up to the nines, bringing all of this treasure in a succession. So, so magnificent was this procession that as it passed through the streets, crowds of people came out to look and wonder. So this is where I think the whole Prince Ali song performance came from because we do have Prince Ali coming down with all of the his servants and all of the people around him, you know, throwing money into the crowds and stuff. And you have that whole spectacle coming up to the palace. Except again, Aladdin is not anywhere to be found here. These are just all things to persuade the Sultan to marry off his daughter or like sell his daughter. So this is when the Sultan is like, yes, Aladdin can marry my daughter. I've never laid eyes on the man, but yes, he can marry my daughter. He can marry the princess. So as soon as Aladdin hears this, he says to the genie, I want to bathe immediately and you must afterwards provide me the richest and most magnificent habit ever worn by a monarch. I want 20 slaves, a horse, I want 10,000 pieces of gold and 10 purses, go and make haste. So he doesn't ask to become a prince like he does in the movies. He just asks for, you know, nice clothes, all this money, all of the slaves and things like that. And it's the presentation, it's the appearance of being wealthy that is what convinces the Sultan, you know, showering the Sultan with presents and gifts and gold nothing to do with earning your wealth, nothing to do with learning from your experiences. Essentially Aladdin has this magic, well magic lamp, he's using the magic lamp genie at this point, he's forgotten all about the ring and that comes back later on, it's very important, and he does end up marrying the princess and he does say to the Sultan, don't let me marry the princess just yet, give me a day. I want to build a palace next to this palace, a place worthy of the princess. And the Sultan's like, yep, yeah, okay, do it. So he gets the genie to make this palace. And yeah, the next day, the Sultan is impressed at the fact that this palace is much better than his. He also asked for a carpet of fine velvet for the princess to walk upon from the Sultan's palace here. I wonder if this is maybe where the magic carpet came from in the films, because there is not one part of this story with a magic carpet that flies through the air. And this one doesn't fly through the air either, but this is like the only time a carpet is mentioned and it is just like put between the palace, well both palaces, so that the princess can just walk along and get into the palace of her dreams essentially. And I guess this is Aladdin showing her a whole new world, a whole new world of falseness and fakery, by the way. Aladdin also leaves part of the palace unfinished and tells the Sultan, oh, I left this for you so that you can have your mark on this place so you get your slaves and you get your jewels and finish off this part of the palace. And so the Sultan tries his best to do that and he gets his people to try and do that, but they can't finish it. And Aladdin's like, okay, take everything down, go go away. And then Aladdin gets the genie to finish it himself. But I don't understand why Aladdin did that. Why did he leave that part and finish to see the Sultan struggle to fulfill it and then show him how much better he is? 
than him by getting, which again, like nobody knows about the genie apart from Aladdin. So like, what was the point in showing up the Sultan? You know, it's it just it rubbed me up the wrong way. Finally, the sorcerer from the beginning who locked him in the cave, he hears about all of this, he comes back and he's determined to get the lamp. And he does manage to trick the princess into giving him it by pretending that he is taking old lamps and giving them new lamps. So she gives him it. And then as soon as he gets it, he wishes that the palace that Aladdin made and everyone inside it, get transported to Africa where he lives, away from China. And when Aladdin comes back, the palace is gone. He's like, wait, what the hell? The Sultan says, I'm gonna kill you unless you can bring me back the palace and my princess in 40 days. 40 days, he has to bring the princess back. And Aladdin looks for three days, he can't find it. And uh, just as he's about to take his own life, he rubbed the magic ring, which he still wore but forgot about, and so the genie of the ring comes out and gets him to transport him to wherever the palace has gone, which takes him to Africa. So again, like, why did we need this magic lamp to begin with? Why did the sorcerer give Aladdin this ring that had all of the power of that lamp in it? I don't understand. Anyway, Aladdin poisons the sorcerer and kills him and transports him back to China. However, the sorcerer had a brother who wants vengeance. So he comes to China, he comes to where they live, and he kills a woman called Fatima, who is a local healer, who everybody loves and respects, and he kills her, dresses up as her, pretends to be her to get inside the palace. He convinces the princess to ask Aladdin to get a rock's egg hung up in the middle of the dome of the palace. And so the princess is like, yeah, I'll ask him. So she asks him, and then Aladdin's like, okay. So he goes to the genie and asks that command, and the genie screams, by an unheard of ungratitude must command me to bring my master and hang him up in the midst of this dome. So what he was apparently asking was for the genie to kill him and hang him in the, in the palace. So this genie, cares about Aladdin. So Aladdin sees that the sorcerer's brother has a dagger concealed in his girdle and Aladdin kills him. The Sultan dies a few years later and Aladdin and the princess end up succeeding him. The end. That was Aladdin. That was Aladdin. There was no Abu. There was no, again, magic carpet. There was no Robin Williams. It's just a whole lot of nothing because when I think of any messages you could learn from it, again, just like absolutely nothing you could take from that. Instead, we had this boy who had always been idle and didn't need to do anything his entire life. Essentially saying like, hey, maybe you don't need to work your entire life. You don't need to work hard for anything. Ask and you shall receive. And we had this really lazy boy, Aladdin, who, when his father died, wasn't able to pass on his trade. Like, oh, what was the whole point in that? What did we learn from that? His father just died. And what even happened with his mother? We didn't even find out. And she was the one who seemed to care so much about him and he didn't really seem to show that much care back. I mean, yes, he does allow her to have all this money and stuff like that and all this wealth, but it's so detached from anything that it really is just showing you, oh, you can solve any problem if you just throw money at it. Okay. I don't like that. I really don't like that. The whole sorcerer thing was interesting, pretend to be his uncle. I just didn't like this one, unfortunately. It's so hard to read and review fairy tales and folk tales, isn't it? <laughs> just not magical in the slightest. If anything, okay, these three fairy tales and folk tales made me appreciate the films more, made me appreciate Disney even more for transforming these into the stories that they are today. Stories that we can really learn from and sit and watch in wonder and magic. And honestly, I just thank so much for my childhood being filled with memories of watching The Little Mermaid, of watching Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast. They brought me so much joy. These fairy tales, unfortunately, did not. I some are better than others. If I was gonna rank them, <laughs> I would probably say, actually, it's been a downward slope in this video. I think The Little Mermaid was the best one, and then Beauty and the Beast, and then Aladdin. So I started off with the best one, and it just went so downhill after that. But I I'm so intrigued to read more fairy tales and folk tales. I haven't read a whole lot of them, but you know, I would like to try and read some more. Maybe not review them, but to maybe analyze them. But yeah, I'm wondering if you've read any good fairy tales and if there's any that you would recommend. My personal favorite fairy tale is still The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. I need to give that one a reread. <laughs> It was an interesting experiment, I guess. So that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave this video a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all your comments down below. Let me know what you thought of the video. Did you enjoy any of the fairy tales that I read? Do you like The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, the films? Let me know down below. Are you a remake person or do you not like them? I wanna give a huge thank you to my patrons and my One Piece channel members. If you'd like to join my Patreon or my One Piece channel membership, then all the links are down in the description box. But yeah, I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye.